thank you everyone for coming. I did not expect a room this big or this much attendance. This is exciting. I'm really thrilled to be here. My name's Mike Bailey. I'm an economist at Facebook. We have a really fantastic panel today I'm really excited about. Often you don't get a chance to talk about data sets or methods, and here we're here to talk to focus completely on new data and methods that you should be using in your research. So that's the name of today's um, panel. Thanks to the American Finance Association for inviting us to do this. Um, the panel is new methods and uh, new data sets and methods for finance research. And so I'll briefly introduce each of our panelists today. So again, my name's Mike Bailey, I'm from Facebook. I manage a team called Facebook and Society, which studies Facebook's impact on society, jobs, fairness, and the world at large. So my team is mostly computational social scientists. Previously, I founded and led Facebook's economics team and was an economics PhD at Stanford before that. Um, we have with us um, Stefano Giglio, who's a professor of finance at Yale School of Management. His research is mostly empirical, and his interests span several topics, including asset pricing, macroeconomics, and real estate. Many of his papers have employed new data on volatility in housing term structures, text data to measure climate change, or clearinghouse collateral data, or, and new methods like machine learning and selecting asset pricing models. We have Camelia Kunin, who's a professor of finance at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an NBER research associate. She is an assistant editor at the journal Finance and at the Review of Corporate Finance Studies. She's a past president of the Society for Neuroeconomics. Her research spans neuroeconomics, household finance, and empirical corporate finance with an emphasis on labor and personal issues. We have Scott Baker, who's an associate professor of finance at the Kellogg School of Management. His research is concentrated in empirical finance and macroeconomics, using native, new data sources to answer classic questions. He is one of the first to utilize detailed household transaction and balance sheet data to answer questions about household, household finance that could not be observed with traditional government survey data or national aggregates. He's also written papers leveraging publicly available data from newspaper archives or Google search data to create indexes of important economic concepts like uncertainty and job search intensity. And finally, we have Rebecca Diamond, who's an associate professor of economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Much of her research studies the many ways through which place of residence and employment influence households, economic lives, and inequality. Some of her recent work has focused on how low-income housing developments change their surrounding neighborhoods, how rent control helps renters in the short run, but fuels gentrification in the long run, and how food deserts play essentially no role in healthful nutrition choices. She also has broad interests in labor economics, including work on the gender wage gap and quantifying the relationship be between income inequality and consumption inequality. She has worked with many new non-traditional data sources, including bank and credit card transaction data, administrative data from Uber, and detailed migration data of the U.S. population. Whew, I did it. So, we have, as you can see, we have an awesome group of people here. They're working with new methods, working with new data, everything from, you know, talking about data uh, research on food deserts to um, to. Uh, Neuroscience research, we have new data sets from finance, from, um, from Google, from you know, newspapers. So this is really exciting. If you're a student, this would be the session you should attend because you know, part of the game now for students is getting access to new data sets. You know, I think a lot of the traditional data sets have been researched to death, mined to death, and part of the game for PhD students is what new data sets can you create? How can you can become a data alchemist to create that new data set for your paper? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So my talk today is going to talk about new, data, new methods of data sets for social networks. Being from Facebook, the largest uh, online social network, I'm going to talk about what we've done at Facebook to um, create new data sets for researchers to use to study social networks, and some of the um, uh, challenges we've ha found in employing that model, and kind of some of the new methods we think are most promising. All right, so there's been a recent explosion in exciting research in finance and economics using, oh, I should say before I begin, so each of us are going to take about 10 to 15 minutes to talk about our research and about the topic in generally, um, and then after we're going to take questions from you all. So we have a mic up here if you want to, when we're done talking, feel free to come up here and form a line if you have any questions, and if not, then I have lots of questions and I'm excited to 
Trump had announced these folks. So there's been a recent explosion in exciting research in finance and economics using new micro data sources. We have government agencies that are releasing new data sets. We have private companies that are releasing new data sets. Um, you know, like traditional companies like large banks, Vanguard, et cetera. We have tech companies like Uber, Mint, Zillow, Trulia, Facebook that are releasing data sets of research to use. So there's been an explosion of these new data that, that we have access to. And more government, in the government side, more government data is moving digitally and there's more data sharing between departments. So you have the USDS, which is a data service meant to bring in tech people to help them make their service more digital, make more interoperability between the data, between the different government departments. You have data.gov, login.gov. So all these initiatives are gonna make data more portable, more transparent, and easier for researchers to use and allow um, hopefully more research projects. Um, one example of this is the Opportunity Atlas that was released last October by Ross Chetty and the Economic Opportunity Project. And essentially, they took census data to understand social mobility. So what's the probability that someone living in an area will earn more than their parents? Well, working with the census, they've now released at a very micro scale, at a census block scale, this atlas of where are areas that have higher or lower social mobility. And you can go th through these cool interactions and see at the census block level, well, in a city like Seattle, what does social mobility lo look like throughout the city versus a place like Memphis? So this is a great example of how working with a government service, they've improved their data to the point now researchers can use it and, and to the point where we can understand a lot, a lot of important uh, social science questions and that now you all can go and get access to this um, opportunity atlas to answer research questions. So there's kind of this uh, democratization of data of where once one researcher can package it up and make it useful, there's hopefully gonna be a lot of papers that can come from that effort. All right. Um, one thing we're doing that's a work in progress with Chetty, Hendren, Jackson, Kukler, and Strobel is we're looking at what is, the inter op what is the interplay between social networks and economic opportunity. So using anonymized Facebook data, we're constructing metrics of social capital. We want to understand what's the interplay between social networks and social mobility. So essentially, we can take this government data on um, the economic opportunity and then take uh, de-identified data from Facebook on social networks and interplay them to make research. So this is an example of how these new data sets are going to start merging and allow us to do completely new research. Um, on, the on the firm side, as markets become more digital or when digital markets are created, it greatly expands our ability to measure what's happening. Um, so as one example, take taxis versus Uber. So one time I was in a taxi and the ride was horrible. It was miserable. The person was talking the entire time. They took the wrong route. And so at the end, I had the audacity to tip them 10% instead of 20%, which led to a huge fight between me and the driver. He claimed that I was extorting him and that he would not be able to, that he was losing money on the fare because I wasn't tipping 20%. So we screamed at each other. I got out of the cab. He drove off. And I realized I left my suitcase in his taxi. <laughs> I had no receipt, no no evidence of what's happening, but I thought, oh, this should be very easy. I paid with a credit card. The credit card company should very easily be able to look up who the service is, what's happening. One month later and over 100 phone calls, I had finally figured out the firm that employed this taxi driver and got in contact with this person and got my bag back. It was one of the longest, most you know, intensive, immersive experiences of my life to try and get my bag back. And I thought what would have been a very easily uh, interplay between you know, the data services of like, oh, the credit card company call, figures out who the company is, they call them, they say, oh, this is a taxi company, I call them. No, it was like all of the, like my transaction went through several brokers, the taxi company went through a dispatcher. It was nearly impossible for them to figure it out. They didn't talk to each other. So this basically made it, would make it impossible for researchers to use this data to study anything interesting on the taxi market. Now take Uber, I recently left my phone in an Uber, and guess what, I was able to call a line, they knew, that, they knew the Uber I was in, they called the driver, they connected me, 15 minutes later I had my phone back. So because of Uber, they have data on everything, who's calling the Uber, what's happening, what the driver's making, who's using it, what, you know, what Ubers are taking. So now if you go to Uber, you can get that data set and you can all of a sudden as a researcher answer incredibly interesting questions 
And so now we have just this plethora of Uber papers that are popping out, looking at things from analysis of labor market, pricing and labor supply curve, the gender pay gap. Um, Rebecca here wrote one of those papers on the gender pay gap. We have a, a paper on coming out on driver safety. So you have all these papers that are coming out because now Uber has taken that taxi data and put it in a place where we, researchers can now use it. And so that's gonna happen with a lot of these tech companies, but also as you have a lot of new markets going online, um, you know, researchers are gonna now answer questions they weren't able to before. Um, so one thing we did at Facebook is we uh, wanted to understand uh, my uh, formatting here got a, a little messed up. So they told me here, never use PowerPoint, which at a tech company I should know, but I guess now I'm learning, <laughs> always put it in a PDF beforehand. Um, but uh, the, basically we, we wanted to look at what is the interplay between social networks that we observe on Facebook and housing markets. So housing market data is often public in the US, and what we did is we did a de-identified match of Facebook data with the housing market data, and we want to understand what are the effect of peer interactions on beliefs and market choices. So we have a couple papers on this, looking at uh, the first one in the GPE, looks at beliefs and housing market choice. In the restad, we look at the, the refinance market. And um, essentially, what we find is that by influencing expectations, social interactions do impact housing decisions. So this is an example of where you take a company like Facebook and by taking the data they have on the social network, taking it to uh, government data on the housing market, we can answer really interesting economic questions. So for example, one of the things we find is that there's a larger effect for people who talk to their friends about house prices. So they're more likely to buy a house when the house prices in their friend's market go up. Um, and the friend's exposure to house price changes influences the probably you buy a house, the price you pay, the size of the house, the price uh, you sell your house, and all these other, other factors. But some of the challenges in working with a firm and uh, getting their data, um, and also working with the government, are that often these firms, very correctly, are, are very concerned about privacy and security. And so this limits the analysis that's being carried out and reproducibility. So at Facebook, we take data security very seriously. We take user privacy very seriously. So we don't let, just let researchers go in and play with individual data. Often we have to de-identify it. It has to go through a privacy and security review. We have to understand what it's gonna be used for, who's going to use it. Um, and a lot of smaller companies just don't have the resources to do that kind of analysis. These collaborations are resource intensive. So each of these projects took um, lots of negotiation between Facebook and the researchers and myself to figure out what we'd work on, what would happen. There has to be a lot of value for the firm in these projects. And there's also PR, comms, legal concerns. So often the, you, you know, firms just don't want researchers coming in writing whatever they want. You have to understand what's the message of the paper, what's going to happen, what's the, what's the value that's going to come out of this. So that, prevents challenge, that provides challenges for working with the government, working with the private sector on new data sets. On the methods side, there's also been a renewed interest in economics for many methods like machine learning, neural networks, GANs. A lot of these are very old, going back to the 50s. It's just there's been an explosion of interest in them recently. So part of this has been a necessity. So with these large, massive digital data sets, you know, you have several terabytes of data, sometimes millions of columns, and you have to use things like dimensionality reduction, PCAs, lassos, TSNEs to visualize user data. And so researchers are having to learn and students are having to learn what these methods are so they can actually work with the data. Without it, it's impossible. Like if you just go in saying, hey, I'm gonna run a regression, then you're totally hosed. There's no way you can just take you know, these several terabytes of data and just load them into Stata and play around with them. You have to figure out, hey, how am I gonna you know, merge this down into the size that Stata can use? Um, and part of this has been finding new applications and increasing our ability to answer questions. So it, uh, it got cut off there, but you know, I was gonna say that you can, um, you know, there's, there's a new ability to do causal inference using the data, like causal trees. Um, there's applications like GANs for game theory research, so getting, um, uh, that's uh, generated adversarial networks, getting them to play games against each other and finding properties of equilibria. And so part of this isn't just being able to use the data, part of it is actually using these methods to answer completely new questions. Um, so, you know, Susan Atheist has a great paper on the impact of machine learning on economics, and um, I was trying to look and, and plot the trend of 
what is the mention of machine learning at the ASSAAA conference over time? Sadly, the past versions, they don't do a very good, they don't have a very good search function, but I essentially found almost no mention of machine learning in session or paper, paper titles before 2016, and only a handful of mentions in the past two years. Um, this year, there was about 50 uh, sessions or titles that had machine learning as a keyword in it. So there's just been an explosion of interest in machine learning specifically. Um, and there's been some great sessions you should look up um, if you have a chance. Um, I want to talk about one of our papers where machine learning was crucial to doing the economic analysis in the paper. So we have a work in progress called Peer Effects and Product Adoption. And the basically what we're trying to understand is what is the influence of your peers on whether you adopt a new product. And here we're looking at the cell phone market. Um, we, on Facebook, we observe the cell phone you use. Often uh, network research is really tricky because you have homophily, similar people have similar friends. So that means you have common shocks and preferences, which means you have correlated behavior. And so identification is nearly impossible. So often you need an instrument that shifts only your friend's probability of purchasing something so you can understand, hey, what's the impact of them purchasing on it on your, on your uh, probably purchasing that uh, cell phone in this example. Um, but we're Facebook, so we observe the social networks. So we actually have all the network data. And Facebook logs the phone people use, so we observe when people switch to a new phone. So here we have this great example of where we have the network and we have people's consumption decision, the phone they use, which is pretty rare to have both of them together. And so we wanna measure what is the pure effect of phone purchases. Well, we need an instrument that will shift the probability our friends buy a new phone and our probability only through that pure effect. So essentially we need our friends to just like randomly decide to buy a new phone. So it'd be ideal if people posted the minutia of their lives publicly on Facebook, like what they ate for breakfast or when they break or lose their phone. Um, if they did that, then we'd be able to say like, oh, this person broke their phone, they posted about it, and then we could say, what's the impact of, of you on, on uh, buying a new phone? Well, luckily, people do this a lot. They do it all the time. People post, hey, my phone's stolen, contact me here to reach me, or broke a new phone, I broke my phone, gonna get a new one, or hey, my phone was stolen. Millions of these posts set to public visibility and this provides a fantastic instrument for us to use in research. But the challenge is how do we find, so we have billions of posts on Facebook, how do we find them? How do we find which ones are about people breaking their phones? The answer is these new machine learning methods. And so here we take a, uh, this is a plot of the probability people buy a new phone and green is people who haven't made a post, um, red is people who have made any post and you notice that it stays mostly around zero. And then in blue we identify people who mention certain keywords like broke my phone, lost my phone. And then in red we fit a neural network set to predict posts that are about people breaking or losing their phone. And you'll notice that the prediction power of the neural network is much better than just sort of randomly picking out uh, posts that have a certain keyword. So here's an example of where we use machine learning to construct a really strong instrument um, for our paper as a first stage in understanding pure effects of phone adoption. And essentially what we find is that there is a very strong um, effect of when your friend breaks your phone, then you're more likely to buy a new phone. And our paper is about, well, which phone do you buy and who's the influencer and who's influenced. And so I'm really excited. So hopefully you'll read it when it comes out. So I just want to uh, wrap up by talking about some of the Facebook research programs we currently have for, for data sharing and for researchers to access. So one of them is we have a data set called the Social Connectedness Index. And essentially what we do is we take the probability of friendship between a random pair of users and every U.S. county pair and every U.S. county and country pair. So take two U.S. counties and we just say, hey, what's the probability two people are friends between them? So essentially it's the strength of friendship between those counties. Um, we have a paper in the JEP in 2018 that basically uh, describes this data set in detail and talks about, hey, well, what's the correlation between this and trade and patent citations and other important macroeconomic phenomena? So go through and read that paper if you want to use this data set because it talks about it in, in a lot more detail. Um, and then the second data sharing program or research program we have is the Election Research Commission. And so this was um, announced last year by, by Mark Zuckerberg and Gary King at Harvard. 
And essentially this was set, meant to solve this PR problem Facebook has, which is Facebook might want to release research around elections or around political science, but you know, Facebook or the firm might have incentives about the messaging that comes along with those papers. But researchers don't want that constraint. They don't, they, you know, we researchers and, um, and academics have scientific standards. They say, hey, look, we want to go in, use the data, answer the question, and research and publish whatever we find. We don't want to be constrained by Facebook's PR department. So the answer is this election research commission where what would happen is that Facebook will release data sets in a privacy safe way to these researchers, maybe on uh, on like a privacy secure server, maybe using differential privacy, and then researchers would apply through apply to access these data sets through a call for proposals and get funded outside of Facebook. So they will get external funding. So there's no concerns about who's paying for this, and then they'd be connected to the data set, be able to write the paper with full academic freedom. And so social science one, um, it, you should look up their website. Um, they, they had their, their they had a request for proposals last fall, and we're set to release our first data set this spring. So the first data set is going to be a URL data set where we release all the URLs shared on Facebook and some aggregated anonymized statistics about who accessed that URL. Um, just as an example, here's the uh, uh, a look at the social connectedness index. So if you look at Cook County in Ohio then you can see that in strong blue are the counties that have a stronger connect friendship connection to that county. And what's interesting is that you see this historical great migration pattern along the Mississippi River, River showing up in the data. So when we looked in the data, we found all these really interesting um, historical patterns show up that um, you know, kind of surprised us and, and that are, are, are a, a fantastic reason of why firms like Facebook should open up and share more of these types of data sets. And so if you want to access to that data set for your research, then email sci underscore data fb.com with its kind of abstract, and we're more than happy to share it with researchers for, for programs. I think there's just a lot of interesting finance and economics research using um, social networks data and data about aggregated networks. And so please apply. And thank you. I'll turn it over to Stefano. All right, so first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me to uh, be part of this panel. Um, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Um, so um, what we're going to talk about today is basically, uh, you know, in the face of this recent explosion of new data, and, and Mike talked uh, quite a bit about these different new data sets, uh, what's the interplay between models and data, and what's the role of new methods? And I'm going to give you some examples from, from, some, uh, from some recent research. Um, so what makes this new data special? Um, so one way to think about it is that we have, you know, we have you know, we've been working with, you know, traditional data in finance for a long time. Think of, you know, CRISP or CompuStat. And these data set, you know, give, gave us really amazing information about the firm and, and the world and asset prices. But they actually turn out to have very little direct information about basically what are the, you know, the fundamental quantities that we actually economically care about. For example, risk preferences and, you know, in the intertemporal concerns of, of people and the heterogeneity in, in the choice of people and their beliefs. Okay, so there are these kind of deep economic quantities on which these, 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 these data that gives us, you know, macro aggregated quantities and equilibrium prices, it's just not very informative about that, okay? And so for these, for these quantities we care about, we typically rely on models to give us some sort of reflected light, okay? It illuminates a bit these kind of darker areas. And what's special about many of these new data that we've been talking about, we're gonna talk about in the panel, is that it actually gives us direct light on much more in, in a kind of inner mechanism of, of the model. So, for example, you can think of categorizing these data sets in a sense by how deep they can allow you to reach inside the models, okay? So think of a first layer in which you get, for example, new market data, and, and so by, by, the, by that, I mean not just new characteristics of firms, I need more like, I mean more like, you know, uh, data on kind of very specialized markets, okay? And the more specialized the markets you get data on, the more kind of specific information you can get about what people people's preferences are and what their beliefs are. So I, I'll talk later about an example in which I'm gonna, uh, we're going to see people trading uh, variance swaps, okay, which are basically uh, instruments in which you can hedge uh, volatility risk. And so then you're going to learn a lot about a very specific topic uh, in, uh, in people's behavior. And then if you go one layer deeper, you can actually now, nowadays observe a lot about very disaggregated individual choice. Okay? And that's obviously, for example, portfolio choice. Okay? That's very directly informative about things we care about. But then you can go even deeper and you can get to what people are thinking, okay? You can 
you can ask people what the beliefs are, you can do some uh, you know, MRI scans or think what's going on inside their brains. So you basically, all together, you can actually get quite deep into understanding uh, how our models work and how human behavior goes, works. And, and, and this allows for kind of entirely new questions to be asked. I mean, if th think about the question like what I wrote there, like what's the role of, of beliefs and heterogeneity in beliefs in driving fluctuation and risk and return? Well, so far until now, we had very little direct information about this, but with this new data, we can actually say a lot about that. Okay, so let me now switch to two examples from my own research that kind of illustrate a bit these ideas. So the first, uh, the first uh, work I wanna talk about is new work that is not out yet, okay, but it's this new research agenda we've been working on uh, with Matteo Maggiori, Jonas Strobel, and, and Steve Urkus from Vanguard. And we don't have a paper yet, but it's gonna be out soon, and the paper is gonna be called Seven Facts About Beliefs and Portfolios. And the core of the paper is we're gonna basically be able to have the same time for the same individual over time, and for a large cross-section of people, uh, both their beliefs about the market and the economy, as well as their trading and portfolio choice. And to do that, we collaborated with Vanguard over the last few years, and for the last two years, we have been basically surveying uh, a, large a large panel of Vanguard investors every two months. Uh, and we got about, two, uh, we have 2,000 responses more or less for each of these waves. So it's a, it's a large panel. And for the same people, we got from Vanguard data on their actual trading and portfolio. So you can have a very rich picture of what these people are thinking, what they're doing in reaction to what they think. And that's gonna tell us a lot about like the kind of fundamental determinants of, of portfolio choice. So what we do in the, in the survey is we elicit uh, very quantitative beliefs. So we are, you know, we ask about basically their short-term and long-term expectations uh, of stock returns, of GDP growth, and and, and, uh, and bond returns. And you know, I'm gonna just give you some 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 glimpse of the of the results. But before that, let me just highlight, you know, some nice features of, of this of this uh, of this uh, of this data. So one of the, the the thing I like the most is that actually we were able to design the, the survey ourselves. And we, we, we can actually use, again, going back to the relation between models and data, we can actually use economic theory to think about what is the kind of data we wanna produce. So, so in this case, you know, we, use, we ask exactly the questions that are most informative from the point of view of thinking about the, and understanding the theories. Uh, so for example, we don't just ask point estimates of what you think stock returns are gonna be next year, we ask about the entire distribution of stock returns. Why? Because you know, uncertainty matters, rare disasters matter, so we're gonna have something to say about that. Um, and the other thing is that it, this is a quantitative survey, which is gonna mean that I'm not just asking, you know, do you think markets are gonna go up or down? We're gonna ask specifically, you know, what is the distribution of, of, of different potential, you know, market returns you're gonna see. Which means that, we, again, we can kind of go back to the models and have a quantitative prediction and test the models quantitatively. The second nice feature of this survey is that, you know, this is, a, this is a survey of Vanguard investors, okay? These are, these are wealthy people, these are sophisticated people that first of all, hopefully they will understand the questions we're asking. But also, you know, you know, obviously what matters for driving uh, aggregate prices and, and equilibrium quantities is, is very important um, what wealthy people are thinking and doing. And so this is, 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 this is gonna allow us to capture that, that dimension, okay? And then the final thing I wanna mention is that we are able to actually construct a panel. So we are all, we're gonna be able to observe for every person over time how their beliefs evolve as well. So I, I, as I said, this paper is called Seven Facts About Beliefs and Portfolio. I'm not gonna tell you, tell you all seven facts, okay? The, 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 I'm gonna give you three and the rest four is a surprise when you read the paper. Um, so the first fact that we find is that indeed there is a very strong relation between the portfolio choice and the beliefs about the expected returns. So this graph illustrates that you have on the x-axis expected returns over the next year uh, for different people, these are kind of aggregated beings. For the, on the y-axis, you have the equity share in their portfolios. And what you see, there's a very strong relation. Yet, this relation is actually much flatter than you would expect given some standard theories, okay? In particular, if you look at the, at the axis, you know, if you go from like five, per, you, you compare to people over time, expectations of 5% versus 10%, they do induce a difference in portfolio shares, but only about another 5%, okay? So from 70 to 75%. So that means that there is a strong relation, but it's not as, uh, as, as, as steep as you would expect, at least in frictional assessment models, okay? So this is, I think, a nice example of the kinds of results we can get with this kind of data. There are other two facts, and this, I think, actually is particularly important, is one of the, we're probably gonna talk more about that in the panel, but, you know, heterogeneity is, the ability of looking at very heterogeneous effects is one of the big advantages of these new data, these new methods. So whereas, you know, you know in the past we might have stopped at just analyzing the average Re average relation, 
with all these rich data sets and these rich methods to deal with them, we can actually ask basically how these sensitivities change, how these treatment effects change in very kind of specific subgroups of the population. So for example, here we can ask, okay, how do this, this sensitivity depend on wealth, on the trading frequency, on, on attention, on confidence? And, and we get a lot, a, basically very nice, very rich picture of, uh, of the relationships in the data. And fact number three is that there's actually a lot of ha action happening on the, on, the, on the trading side. So there's actually, you, there's very different, we obtain very different results whether you look at the extensive margin or the intensive margin. And what do I mean by that is if you, if you look at a person changing their beliefs and you, you ask, okay, how do they trade in response to these changing beliefs? Turns out there's actually zero action going on on the extensive margin. So, you know, basically beliefs are totally used as a predicting when people trade, but there's a lot of action going on in the intensive margin. Conditional on trading, you actually see the beliefs predict the, the direction and the quantity, the magnitude of the trading, okay? So, as I said before, there's a lot of interesting implications for the theory that comes out of this data. First of all, because the sensitivity of portfolio to beliefs is, in a sense, a fundamental channel of transmission of beliefs into the aggregate quantities. You can have beliefs fluctuate wildly, but if people don't react to their beliefs, you know, by actually trading, it's not gonna transmit into prices. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of interesting dimension of heterogeneity. Okay, so that's the first uh, kind of set of data and models I wanted to talk about. The, my second topic, in a sense, is about small data. Uh, it's, about, it's about new markets data, okay? So the motivation for this is that there's been a huge amount of work in asset pricing and in macro finance uh, about the importance of dynamics and fluctuations. So, you know, do we care about shocks, the dynamics of shocks? Do we care about long-run shocks, short-term shocks? And there's been a very, uh, you know, blooming uh, literature on this topic. And it turns out that the best place to actually test these predictions is by looking at term structures. So why? Because what is a term structure? It's just a set of assets which are literally differentially exposed to horizons, right? So you have some long horizon assets and some short horizon assets. So obviously, when you care about dynamics, you want to test these theories looking at, at assets that are really naturally sorted by this exposure to, to the dynamics. But if you think about what happened in the last 50 years, we, we basically almost never used any term structure data, you, you know, in except, you know, except treasury bonds, okay? But for anything else, we didn't really, for any other types of risks, which is not interest rate risks, we really didn't have any, any, any data, okay? And there's been an explosion of new data on term structures, and I'm gonna mention here three. One is the work on dividend term structure that, uh, you know, Bisberg and Brand and Cohen have been doing. And then I'm gonna talk now about two different term structures. One is the housing term structure, so claims to houses at different horizons, and then is the volatility term structure, which is claimed to hedges to volatility shocks at different horizons. How am I doing on time? Oh, that's great. It's much better than expected. Okay, I guess I speak too fast. Okay, so the, let me first talk a little bit about the housing term structure. Um, so this work we've been uh, doing the last few years with uh, Matteo Maggiore and Strobel, and the idea is, is that, you know, you don't naturally think of housing have, as having a very natural term structure, okay? You buy a house, you know it's forever, you can resell it. When the person buys it from you, you know, he thinks he's gonna own it forever and so on, okay? But it turns out that in some markets, for example, in the UK, uh, and in Singapore and in a few other markets, you can actually buy houses forever, like we are used to in the US, that's called a freehold, but you can also buy a house just for a limited amount of time, okay? You can buy a house, for example, for 100 years, and then after those 100 years, the house returns to the owner, and that's called the leasehold. And you can see there's a very natural term structure here, and why do we care about that? Because it basically reveals to us how people perceive housing risk at different horizons. So why is this the case? Because think about comparing the price for the same house for the, the price of a permanent, house, uh, a, you know, a permanent housing contract, a freehold, to a house that you only own for the first 100 years. Well, the difference in prices is exactly the value you assign today to having the house 100 years from now, okay? And in that you're incorporating, of course, the time discounting, but also the risk discount, right? How much you care, how you perceive the risk of the value of the house 100 years from now. So what we do is we get a very large data set of housing transactions in the UK and in Singapore, and we estimate for different horizons this difference in prices with the, the, between the leases and the freeholds, and you see, you see them plotted here, okay? So this is for different bins of maturity of the, of the lease, the difference between that lease of that maturity and the freehold. So for example, if you look at the first bar here, this is telling you that uh, if you compare a, hundred, you know, a lease with about 80 to 99 years remaining with a freehold, you get about 15% discount, okay? That's a large number, okay? It means that 15% of the value of your owning a house forever is coming for basically after the first 100 years, okay? 
So people do seem to assign quite a bit of value of this long-term housing. Well, that kind of has to imply that you're discounting these cash flows at low discount rates. And so what we learn from this is that people are discount, that the, long, the discount rate for long housing claim is low. In our estimates, it's 2.6%. Now, combined with other data on housing, what this tells us is, in fact, that the discount rate, the term structure of discount rates in the housing market is down a slope. That means people want much bigger risk premium on the short end than on the long end. It means that they are scared about short-term risks, but not scared about long-term risks. When you look at the volatility markets, and this is work with Ian Dubecker and Len Marius Rodriguez, you actually see very similar patterns. So in the volatility markets, what you can do, you can get data, and that's what we did, you can get data on the price of kind of insurance people are buying to hedge against volatility shocks at different horizons. So, you know, I, can, I may be very scared about tomorrow's, you know, next month volatility, I can buy insurance against that. Or I might be scared about very long-term volatility, I can buy insurance against that. And of course, when you look at the, the amount people are paying for this insurance, you can learn something about how much they care about this type of risks. So in this graph, what they have is for contracts of different maturities, the cost of, this, of buying this type of insurance, okay? Now, the cost here is, is expressed in terms of sharp ratios. They're negative because you're paying for the insurance. So what this, 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 this picture is saying is that if you're trying to, to hedge next month volatility, you're losing an enormous amount of money, okay? You're getting a negative sharp ratio of 1.4. Now, that's a big number, okay? The, the sharp ratio of the market is 0.4. You're losing, by getting a sharp ratio of minus 1.4, you're losing money at an incredible speed. So why are people so happy to lose money at this incredible speed? It's because they're getting something they really value. And that is insurance against very short fluctuations in financial markets, based, I think, of as market crashes, okay? Two minutes, per. On the other end, if you look at the other end of this curve, what you see is that this, this is a zero line, okay? Insurance against long-term volatility gets a zero risk premium. People don't seem to really care about long-term volatility. So this result tells us that people care about short-term volatility. The housing result tells us that people care about short-term housing risks. And, and the dividend interest rate data also tell you, which from, from Ralph and co-authors, tells you that people care about short-term dividend risk. And so there's kind of a common theme here. By using this transstructure data, we can get something, we can learn very sharply what people, that people care about the short end of, of, of the short, you know, short maturity, the, the, the recent future, in a way you couldn't learn with traditional data, okay? So I'm gonna just conclude in my, minute and a half left. Um, but I try to kind of, again, th uh, think about models, new data, and new methods. So we are now in a, in, in a time where we, we not only have all these enormous new data sets, and the ones, that, for example, that, that, that Mike talked about, we also are developing new statistical methods that really allow us to say a lot about these new data sets without having to put a lot of economic constraints, okay? So for example, you have all these machine learning and statistical model selection methods. And what they're able to do is they're able to find relations between you know, the variables in the data sets without actually having to impose any economic priors, okay? Now, I would like to kind of remark that in fact, even in the face of all these new methods, the standard economic kind of models are basically still playing a fundamental role, okay? Not just because they're important to identify the questions, but also because exposed, you kind of need this model to interpret the results. And in some cases, you can even produce, like in the case of the service later, you can use the economic theory we learned from the models to actually guide what kind of data you're gonna look for and produce, okay? And I wanna conclude by saying, look, there, you know, it turns out that there's kind of an apparent tension here between kind of the machine learning view of the models and the kind of traditional economic theory view of the models. Because both of them, starting from very, very different priors, are gonna basically kind of condense the data into something low dimension, okay? You can do it by using economic priors, or you can, you know, do it by, by using kind of statistical priors, like sparsity. You're gonna start from a different set of priors, you're gonna end up with different set of, re of, of results or models, okay? And so, you know, it's actually only an apparent, of course, it's just an apparent tension, because there are just two different representations of the data, and it turns out that actually some of the most exciting work in this field, I think, is actually bridging these two. So there's a lot of new econometrics techniques that are actually trying to say, look, with econometrics, we care about inference, so we're trying to get to the structural parameters. With machine learning, we care about prediction, we can get a lot of important reduced form relationships. How do we bridge this gap? Well, a lot of the new kind of most exciting research, in my view, is gonna be exactly on the on design to try to bridge these two, these two views of the world. Okay, thank you very much. All right, hi everybody, it's good to see you all. Um, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. Um, rather than telling you about specific findings in my own work, I will walk you through um, 
some general pros and cons about using um, a few types of new data or new methods that I have encountered in my, in my career, and hopefully um, you'll get something useful out of it. So I've, um, I roughly work in two areas in finance. Um, the first would be what you'd call these days household finance. Um, and then the second area is uh, what you'd call labor and finance. In the household finance uh, realm, I actually started my career by doing work in neuroeconomics. Um, I was running experiments, and this was back in 2006 when I was just out of the PhD program at Stanford. Um, so back then, by the way, there was no field called household finance. It was, this term didn't quite exist. It, was, uh, it got popular, the field, thank God it's popular now, but it, it got popular because of two things. Uh, John Campbell had a presidential address at the 2006 AFA that was titled Household Finance. So actually he uttered those words and they kind of caught on. And the other thing that happened was um, the recession. So because we know now that households behavior actually matters for macro outcomes, um, now we can have a field called household finance. But in the beginning, it was a lot of what we're doing uh, that you'd call today household stuff were basically it was experiments. And I was doing a kind of experiment that involved collecting brain imaging data as well as genetic data. Now why did I do that? Or why would you go towards collecting unusual kinds of data in your work? You only do that if that particular kind of data helps you address a specific question that you have in mind. And what I had in mind in the beginning of my career was to understand the micro foundations of the formation of risk preferences and of learning, how humans learn in an environment about risk and reward, about things that are um, definitely happening out there in, in financial markets, good outcomes, bad outcomes, how do we learn from them? And so for to really understand the minutia of how we learn or how, how our, our risk preferences over time might evolve, I had to use um, brain imaging, and I had to use genetics approaches. Now, um, I'm saying it because some people are super excited about using new data, including these sort of more biological data that I just mentioned. Sure, they're exciting and they're novel. Uh, it was so cool to run the first imaging study where we could predict investment behavior with what's happening in the brain. It was cool, but that's not the reason why you want to do it. You want to do it because, again, that particular data or approach helps you with your specific question. Um, there may be some really cool data out there that you could use or an experiment you could run that would kind of help you uh, answer your question, but it would be so costly to run that it would just not be the most efficient way for you to answer the question. So, um, again, the, I'm saying it because I, I, you, when you see a data set, you should say, ask yourself, is this what I need for my research question? Or is it just a ginormous hammer that I just found with which I could tap on a tiny little nail, you know, so use the right hammer for the right kind of nail. Here. Um, the, uh, the good news, though, about using experiments, whether or not they involve um, genetics or brain imaging data, the good thing about using experiments is that you can design the experiment to fit your research question, right? You have control over that. So that is amazing because data sets you find elsewhere may not have the exact dependent and independent variable or just the right intervention or treatment that, that you care about to test your theory. So experiments give you control. That's a, that's a pro. That's a good thing. But at the same time, experiments which are costly to run are also sometimes a little bit too far removed from reality. And I mention this because as an author of those uh, types of papers, I got a lot of pushback as to whether or not the setting that I was using, that experiment that I had designed, was truly capturing something out there in the real world. And, and to be honest, now I'm, I, I work for the JF and assist, as an associate editor, I kind of ask the same question of many authors, is, it, is your setting really capturing reality? So I'm finding myself on the other side. Um, so experiments are great, you can tweak them to address your direct question, but they could be too far from reality, so you've got to find a nice uh, a place in the middle when you design them. Um, I've also used in my work survey data. This is another way in which you can measure things like risk preferences or expectations. Um, and um, one thing that people don't realize about survey data, <clears throat> but once I say it, you'll be, of course, it's obvious, 
is that you can actually design your own survey too. You, could, you can commission your own survey. You don't just have to rely on existing survey data. So you can work with a company like Qualtrics, for example, and you can say to them, I would like to get answers from 5,000 people located in these states of roughly these demographics, and here's the survey, and that's something you can design using their software. It's very easy to use, and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to do that. So again, you can sort of design your experiment, which is not going to be in the lab. It's going to be a survey. That survey could actually in it have treatment and control groups. It could be very much an experiment, uh, but it's something you could do at scale using a professional provider of these types of services, I, for example, Qualtrics. Um, and so this is doable by any one of us. Um, there are also surveys that exist out there that are um, run by various um, institutions, some government, some, some academic institutions, onto which you can tack on a module, a, a module of your own. So you can pay a little bit of money, but you can have the population of individuals who, had, who were surveyed before by the institution about whom you know a whole lot of stuff. You can actually ask those individuals through your little separate module that you're paying for the questions that are relevant to your own research. So the, the, the point I want to, again, I want to make about surveys is that you don't just, you're not forced to only use what's out there, which you can download from the website of the Michigan Survey of Consumers, for instance. You could get your own survey data, um, and it's, it's, very, it's quite feasible. I've also used, um, in, um, in, again, in assessing more the behavior households rather than their their preferences or their expectations about things relevant to financial markets. Um, I've used some administrative um, financial data. I'm actually in the process of working right now with a with a bank, and the, the data are phenomenal. You can you can learn about these people's spending and and um, saving decisions. So it's pros and cons for this kind of data, that's from what I've learned. So the pros are, this is admin data, right? Amazing, everybody is asking for admin data, you got it, wonderful. Um, there's another pro, which is that the providers of these data, especially if they happen to be, in my experience, um, for-profit institutions, like a bank or like, like a Facebook, these people have um, infrastructure set up so they can deal with the gigantic amount of data that they sit on. Whereas you, in your office or in your university, you may not have that, that infrastructure. So uh, it's actually, you're, I've learned that, that, the, that industry, in my opinion, is way ahead of us academics in terms of their computational power and ability to deal with big data. So you can actually learn from the industry guys when they're using, you're using their, their data. Now, there are some cons to using admin data. So if you find a good institution that you can partner up with, a bank or a Facebook or something, um, there will be legalese. So it took me six months to uh, get this bank to agree to share with me some of their data and a lot of you know, signing documents. And then the other thing you discover is, not, is that not everything is well documented. So, so um, you know, you, unlike the Michigan Survey of Consumers, about which you can you can figure out pretty much everything about the questions asked and how variables are coded and what is a missing versus a true zero in the data. Unlike that kind of data, when you work with admin data, you might find yourself asking, begging for a data dictionary and not getting it because nobody really came up with one because everybody knew what they're working on and it's you, the academic, who's sticking their nose in there. You're the person who doesn't know and it's not their problem. So be, just be prepared to spend a lot of time understanding the data and begging for variable definitions. Um, um, I've worked with other kinds of data using textual analysis, and I think uh, we're going to have, probably Scott's going to cover that a little bit. Um, that's not super complicated, and it's actually not super novel anymore, but by God, it was novel in 2009 when I did it. Um, and then I also worked with some data using, uh, actually from about MBA students um, in, in the side of my work that I've done in, with respect to labor and finance. And, and again, from, from using this admin data, I realized that the provider of the data didn't quite know everything about, about this data. Some parts of the organization knew about one little subset and, uh, and other parts knew about some other little subset and people didn't know who to contact to, to merge the two things together. So, um, so admin data is, again, is, is wonderful to get, but it might, might take a long time to understand. 
So I'm going to move now to um, just a, some more broad strategy lessons that I've learned by, by using data that are unusual or approaches that are unusual. The first bullet point I think is the most important. Um, when you use unusual data or different methods from what standard finance is used to, it makes it super hard to publish your paper in finance journals. Um, why? Well, because when you try to publish a paper, you send it to a journal, the journal has to find referees who are qualified to judge your paper. For them to be qualified, they must have worked with the same sort of data that you've used or with the same kind of methods. And if you're trying to innovate, then there's nobody else out there who can judge what you're doing because you're the first one doing it. Right? So you have to be super good at explaining to the profession the data you're using or the method that you're using. You need to explain to them why you have to go to these new things. Why can't you answer your research question with the old data or the old methods? And so that's all new and it's super important basically when you do something new to be able to pitch in a very clear way to the rest of the profession why what you're doing is important and, and what is the essence of the new approach that you're doing so they can understand it at a very basic intuitive level. Um, so, but even with the best of explanations, the profession will still encounter some resistance, so be patient, roll with it, it's going to work out eventually. Um, you should really try hard to write multiple papers if you use a new data set and a new method, be efficient. Uh, that should be pretty obvious. And then the, the last thing I want to say, this is my, my third bullet point here, <clears throat> is when you work with new data, it means that, or new, new methods, you have to work with co-authors who are not of necessarily a finance person, right? So Mike here, he's at Facebook. Now, thank God he's, he's trained as an economist. He knows what his co-authors are talking about. But you might find yourself having to co-author with somebody who's not, doesn't have a PhD in finance or in econ. I, had to, I worked with, with people who had PhDs in neuroscience. And so you and your co-authors will be speaking different languages. And also, you'll have different goals. They might want to publish a publication in their field journal, that's not maybe what you want to do. And so when you work with these different data and methods, you have to ahead of time, before you put in all this work and, and understand the data and the method, you have to sit down with your co-authors and say, okay, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to publish this one paper in a finance journal, the other one in the sociology or neuroscience or whatever, machine learning or computational journal. Just have a strategy in place, um, but be aware that when it comes to that paper that will have to go to the Journal of Finance, you, the finance person, you will write pretty much the whole thing. Because you know the audience, you know the references, you know how to pitch it to that audience, so it's going to be on you. Just you got to be prepared to put in that investment. Um, it should pay off if you found a wonderful new data set or a new approach, but it will take a bunch of effort. All right, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to uh, pretty much focus just on uh, new data and, and some of the, the kind of pros and cons uh, as well. And, you know, we can defer some of it to the kind of the question um, portion. And Mike was asking about a, a graph about the growth in big data and machine learning. So this was not at the AS ASSA, but this is using uh, MBR working papers. Um, and so it wasn't quite 2016, but certainly a huge, huge rapid growth in, uh, you know, big data, machine learning um, in the last several years, right? This is, this is like a big new sexy topic. Um, I kind of want to make the point that, you know, a lot of the focus is on big data, and I certainly, you know, like big data. It's great. It's big. It's, you know, lots to do with it. There's lots of people in it. Um, but there's also a, a big increase, I think, in just simply new data. Um, and some of this is actually more accessible, uh, you know, for, for like some of the students in the room or who don't have many years or many hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in like developing corporate relationships or things like that. Um, I mean, Camelia was saying, you know, six months to get into, to, into that. That seems like the fastest I've ever heard of, you know, getting in with a corporate partner. I mean, that's incredible. Um, I've taken years. Um, there's a, a lot more uh, accessibility of like government and administrative records, um, even not even just recent records, but kind of going back hundreds of years um, in, in, in some cases. Um, and there's a lot more new tools to kind of digest this new sorts of data, a lot of which is um, textual. And, and so that's where maybe some of the, the machine learning can come in. 
Um, and so this is kind of a, a similar graph, but just showing the rise of administrative data is uh, maybe not quite as steep and explosive, but certainly is becoming uh, more and more common in, in economics and in finance as well. Um, so what I've done kind of in my, you know, uh, uh, perhaps somewhat briefer career um, than some here is uh, kind of developing new data, either finding uh, new data and really bringing it to an economics audience or a finance audience, um, or just creating uh, data um, kind of from, uh, you know, maybe from, from sources that aren't necessarily, you know, aimed at uh, developing research papers. Um, and so I have two main strands, using kind of public raw data to create indices and, and utilize them. Um, and this is something that I think you know, pretty much everyone can do through your university library. You have access to a lot of databases that, that can be used in, in some of these ways. Um, and then also one thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart is, is using uh, transaction-level financial data to, to develop kind of new insights about uh, household finance and, and consumption research uh, relative to, to previous administrative data sets or uh, surveys. And I think both are kind of increasingly accessible and, and quite interesting. Um, to speak a little bit about the kind of new, developing new data yourself, um, I have a number of papers that have been, you know, working with uh, things like um, online APIs from like Google, uh, Google Insights and Trends. Um, there's a lot of data now. If you go to like Zillow, they have this huge, tremendous amount of like rent and, and home ownership and, and home price data that you can just download freely. So there's a lot of this, this data becoming available. Um, I've certainly heavily used newspaper archives, again, something that a lot of, you know, if, if you're uh, a student or a faculty at a uh, university typically has some subscriptions to, you know, ProQuest or Access World News or other newspaper aggregators in which you can, you can leverage some of this to kind of develop your own indices, to kind of run different queries uh, and, you, you know, offload some of the infrastructure onto um, uh, these outside companies. And another thing that I've certainly learned is that making the data available to others uh, really boosts the impact of, of the paper and kind of, you know, your citation count, fantastic. Um, and, you know, when you're developing your own data, uh, this is something that you can pretty freely do. Something that's not true about the, you know, financial transaction data that I'll talk about um, in a bit. So thankfully, you know, Facebook and some of these other companies have been at least making uh, versions of their data somewhat aggregated that can be released. Um, which is extremely helpful. Um, but if you kind of control the data from, from start to finish almost, um, you can, uh, you know, publish it and, and post it online. And, you know, for all these papers, uh, for me, you can, you can easily download all the data that I use to, to write these papers. Um, so we even have a website. This is the policyuncertainty.com. Maybe some of you in the room have, have used this data set. Um, but, you know, developing kind of newspaper-based uh, indexes of policy uncertainty for the U.S., the world, kind of lots of different countries, categorical indices, and this has certainly, you know, enabled a lot of future research um, and, and is something that was done with kind of these newspaper records that are increasingly digitized for newspapers around the world. Um, and so then on to the, the second kind of source of, of new data um, that is, is a bit, is, you know, one of my passions. Um, which is about household transactions and balance sheet data. Uh, and there's an increasing amount of sources uh, of this kind of class of linked account data. Um, one is the financial institutions themselves. So, you know, there's some folks at the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute now that have access to, you know, millions of J.P. Morgan Chase customers and all of their banking transactions and investments and mortgages and all sorts of things like that. Um, you can use software intermediaries like Yodly or Mint.com or Hello Wallet that sometimes partner with outside researchers. And there, these are kind of online financial sites that like aggregate uh, and integrate across all of your different financial accounts. And so I can see, you know, if I, if I work with, uh, you know, Mint.com, I can see somebody's not only their JP Morgan account, but also their Bank of America account and their, you know, Vanguard retirement account and all these other things. Um, and then there's also some governmental or administrative sources, and these are more common in the Scandinavian countries, uh, where there's, they, they have huge amounts of detail on um, household assets, income, um, um, and, and so they can kind of impute consumption. Okay. Uh, so my own experience with this data, I, I've written a lot of papers or kind of have a lot of papers in progress with different versions of this data. Um, so Mint.com, I, I started working with them as a, as a graduate student at Stanford. Um, thankfully, they were just, you know, a bike ride away. Um, and there I looked at, uh, you know, how income changes uh, can affect consumption, kind of intermediated through uh, household um, uh, kind of debt and leverage. Um, I've also used some other online personal financial sites, some online banks. You know, Nielsen now, Nielsen household scanner data has super detailed 
uh, purchase data for you know, uh, tens of thousands of, of Nielsen consumers, where you can see every uh, individual item that they're buying. Okay, and so all of these provide a lot more kind of ability to you know, parse out specific, like the micro foundations of some macro things that we care about, right? And especially nowadays, a lot of what we care about is uh, not just average effects, but you know, quantile, uh, quantile effects, or thinking about heterogeneity, or thinking about inequality, um, and kind of disparate impacts. Uh, and this, this sort of, of kind of much more muscular uh, sets of data really allow us to ask and answer some of those questions. Uh, and, you know, as was said earlier, you might have to, you know, dealing with referees, uh, you might have to really convince them that uh, these new sorts of data are just as valid as some of the old sorts of data. So kind of half of my job market paper became validating this new online personal financial data, uh, comparing it to things like the SCF and the CPS and the Consumer Expenditure Survey and all these, you know, standard sorts of data. Uh, and you get very similar things. So you can look at income distributions, assets, savings, all sorts of stuff. Um, but you get a much smoother distribution because instead of a couple thousand individuals, you might have 10 million, right? And this allows you just to do a lot more regressions or if you're interested in a policy change in a particular state or a particular city, you have enough density, you have enough of a sample there that you can still do some kind of meaningful uh, econometrics. Um, so some, some brief pros and cons again. Um, so again, like huge sample sizes allows for a lot more heterogeneity tests. Um, especially for this sort of data, linking between different aspects of the balance sheets, income and consumption is, is hugely important. It's something that we don't often have in some of the earlier uh, uh, government run surveys. So there might be one survey that specializes on income, another that specializes on assets, another that specializes in retirement wealth, but there's nothing that really integrates them uh, in a nice uh, consistent panel. These are often true behavior, not just survey responses. They might suffer from some sorts of biases, but maybe not recall bias. Um, there are uh, textual descriptions often associated with these, uh, with these transactions. So you'll see, just like you see in your bank account, there'll be a, a textual description. You can do things like linking to particular retailers, linking to particular employees for pay stubs. And so you have, again, an, uh, a lot more uh, of an avenue to uh, kind of link to outside data. Um, and for some, for some platforms, you might even have the ability to run some experiments. So if you, if you get in, you know, if you get on well enough with the, with the CEO or something, uh, you might be able to uh, run some experiments and kind of change some of the, uh, change some of the, the, the formatting of, of, a, of a website or, or of a site or maybe uh, run some survey questions um, on, the, um, uh, on the customers. And then also, you know, these are really high frequency things. So for these transaction level data, you have every, transactions, uh, every transaction that somebody makes. So this is often multiple transactions in a particular day. This is not aggregated to an annual or even a quarterly or monthly level. Uh, and so this allows us to ask new questions that couldn't really be um, asked before. Um, but there's certainly some uh, disadvantages as well. So especially with the new sorts of data, and some of the transaction level data uh, certainly qualifies, uh, there's a lack of a long panel. So we can't look back to you know, the 1950s or even the 1970s or 1990s. Often these sorts of data only go back to, to 2010. So even if we want to think of questions involving the business cycle, um, they might not cover the Great Recession. And so all we have to work with is like a long boom, and you have to lean really heavily on local you know, geographic variation in uh, economic conditions. Uh, to say something uh, about heterogeneity there. Uh, another big problem, and some referees and some editors and some journals care more than others, is that other researchers might not be able to very easily uh, access or replicate the data. And I think right now some of the novelty, you know, a, a lot of the journals are trying to grapple with some of these questions about, you know, if there's some sort of proprietary data, to what extent uh, can we publish this and still, you know, maintain uh, um, kind of be in compliance with our data, stated data policy. Um, representativeness can certainly be a concern for, for non-administrative data as well. These are not you know, equally uh, weighted surveys or, or randomly done uh, um, uh, groups of, of, of uh, customers. You know, for some of the online sites in particular, you might have to convince people uh, more than others that uh, what you're seeing is something that can tell us about the broader population of the US or, or the world. Um, legal issues certainly come into play uh, as well, and, and stability and persistence of, of, the, um, uh, of the databases uh, can be an issue. And I've certainly experienced this myself. I no longer have access to the mint.com data. It's very sad, 
uh, you know, we're trying to get back in, but uh, you know, it's unclear if, we, if we'll be able to. Uh, and so, you know, this leads to some issues of, you know, you're not accumulating this, you know, hundreds of researchers that have all used the SCF for the, the CPS, and there's documentation spanning decades uh, across, you know, all these different sorts of institutions. Uh, and so it might just be you, uh, and again, you know, with a lack of, like, data dictionaries, uh, this, can, this can be particularly problematic. All right, so I, I'm going to maybe leave these uh, for some of the uh, panel discussion, but like I said, you know, replication, um, anonymity is going to be a, a concern as well with these private companies especially, and maybe with some of the, the issues with leaks or, or, you know, potential for biases or, you know, some of Facebook's uh, uh, fun in, in, in recent years. Uh, questions of consumer confidentiality really start to become important, and you, know, you can't just post all this data on your website. You have to maybe only release aggregated versions, or you know, be very careful about how you do uh, do things or where you're using the data. You have you might have to be on site or have some you know a dedicated machine uh, that that you're working on uh, rather than your own personal laptop. Um, but I think there's still a huge amount of value that can be answered with these uh, new sorts of, of data, especially with this, this transactional data. I think this is going to be kind of the new gold standard in household finance and, and consumption research. Uh, there's a lot new, of new questions that can be asked, new classes of questions, better understanding of heterogeneity, better understanding of, of you know, not just an average effect, but, but a, a distribution uh, of effects across you know, a widely uh, diverse population you know, in the U.S. and, and um, abroad. Okay, so I think that you know, this is really going to lead to some cutting edge research, especially as uh, folks with, with more structural and theory chops than I do um, start to really utilize the data to, to discipline some you know, classic and, and maybe new um, structural and theoretical models. Um, and one nice thing is that uh, you know, one of the downsides is that there's a lack of a long panel for a lot of these data sources, but you know, as time goes on, that, that uh, complaint kind of gets uh, uh, weaker and weaker. And, you know, Fingers crossed we'll have a new recession soon uh, and have a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, aggregate uh, economic fluctuations in the, in the data now, okay? So I think that's it for me. Thanks. So first, uh, thanks for including me on the panel. Uh, I'm a labor economist, so um, I'm going to try to say something vaguely related to finance, but it uh, seems like household finance is branching out in its definition of topics of interest, so maybe it'll be interesting to some of you. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about my work with uh, new and different data sources, but also how they can be useful, some pretty old classic questions we've been asking for a long time with classic data sets and how we can maybe make some progress um, on some of these older questions we've been interested in for a long time. Um, so before I get into some specific examples, even in my you know, relatively recent um, number of years of being an academic economist, I've discovered an explosion of different private sector type data sources out there to work with um, that in many cases strongly dominate the traditional data sets we've known and worked with for a long time. Um, a few of my recent papers have worked on uh, a new data set I discovered from a company called Infutor, which is, they call themselves an identity management company, um, and they essentially sell um, address histories for everyone, all adults in the U.S., to companies that are trying to track you down to collect medical debt from you or mail you stuff in the mail to try to sell you stuff. Um, and luckily, that information is super interesting and useful as a researcher, even if I don't want to collect your debt or, or sell you anything, but no academics, as far as I'm aware, have really worked with this kind of um, sort of consumer marketing data that is out there and for sale to, you know, whomever wants to buy it. Uh, and this really dominates the traditional data sources out there. So if you wanted to study a panel of migration of looking at where people have lived over time and what determines where they move, you really, before um, this type of data set, or maybe you have restricted use IRS data, I think that's really the only other alternative, but the traditional public use stuff um, was the NLSY or the PSID, which really had you know, a few thousand households for the whole country. Um, and to study anything with any kind of geographic detail was impossible. Whereas with Infutor, you can study a policy change that happened in a small city and you'll have close to the universe of all adults, so you'll have enough power to actually look at these effects and study um, intricate details of how people make these uh, migration decisions. So I think there's a lot of power 
um, and many type of economic questions where this, this data could be used, and I think we're just starting to scratch the surface. Um, I've also worked with some of this bank and credit card data that um, Scott and others have talked about. Um, he also alluded to it really dominating the traditional source, which is the consumer expenditure survey. Again, government survey data, small samples, survey biases. Um, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but when you work with one of these bank or credit card linked account um, databases, you have millions of consumers and you have the raw data, what they actually bought, what they actually did. They don't have to remember of, oh, how many times did I go out to eat this week or last month? It's hard to necessarily recall all those things accurately. Um, I've also worked with um, Uber data. So Uber, as, we, as um, we heard earlier, has some really nice features because it measures everything so precisely and detailed as a, just as a side effect of their business. And you can work with um, both payroll data and the production of producing rides for people from A to B and commingling very detailed productivity data with pay data allows you to look at a lot of interesting um, questions from a labor economics per, uh, perspective that usually would just be unable to be measured in a, in a classic data set. And I'll give you an example um, in, in a few minutes. And really there was no good traditional alternative to this type of data. You could work with census data, their confidential records of you know, quarterly earnings for much of the population, but quarterly earnings don't tell you anything about wages. You don't know hours versus wage if they made a lot of um, earnings. And you don't really know anything about what the firm or the individual worker actually did to produce those earnings. So there's lots and lots of unobservables in, in classic, classic data sets. Um, another category that I think is increasingly interesting and available are these private sector companies that essentially collect public data that was kind of off the radar and hard to work with. So CoreLogic is an example of this, where deeds records for housing purchases and mortgage transactions are available at any county assessor's office or deeds office. And in theory, you could go to that county and get a big stack of papers of all their deeds and all the transactions that have happened, and you could type them into your computer. That's going to take you a long time. The data is you know, per se free in that sense, but CoreLogic has done all that for you and put it together um, and made a, an easily accessible with a data dictionary um, data set for you to work with. And there are more companies out there doing this sort of thing. Lots of data um, about court cases and legal documents. Uh, you can get data on um, divorce records. You can get data on DUIs, on crimes, all this kind of stuff that's reported by uh, the courts that's in the um, sort of public sphere of information is just sitting in some paper copy in some courthouse and you probably can find some company that's already collected it and put it in a data source, a, a database. Um, so some of these topics have already been covered by previous panelists, but obviously there are a lot of key advantages to these new types of alternative data out there. Um, large sample size is key. Um, I worked with um, some data using the migration data I told you about studying a policy reform on rent control in San Francisco. And that type of policy reform in any other data set, I would have had like five people treated and five people in the control group and I would have no sense to be able to actually look at any kind of uh, empirically or quantitatively powerful estimates. But when you have the whole universe, you actually can end up with a sample size of 30,000 households and actually use these quirky little policy changes that can be local um, and make, make some progress there. And they're often collected, quote, you know, direct from the source. And it's not survey bias. This is actually what the people did. And to the extent that the data is, you know, collecting, you know, it, there's no measurement error in the collection process of the data, you can really have much more uh, detail and accuracy in what, you, what you're trying to measure. Um, many times, if you, these are some of these data sets, you have to partner with a corporate, um, corporate company, and they have to, you know, there's lots of legalese around that. And then linking those data to other sources can be tricky. But other ones, you know, these are data sets that are for sale. Um, so once you buy it, and there's usually some restrictions on what is and isn't allowed, but you can then link them to other public use sources. So we've linked um, the Infotour data to patent records, which is allowing us to see detailed information on patenting and migration, which is um, pretty exciting. Um, clearly, there's some downsides that we've already highlighted less transparency in how the data were really collected. You kind of, you know, when you look at Uber drivers, for example, you have everyone who's an Uber driver. But how do you know whether this is the typical low-skill worker, 
you know, average worker in the economy, who are these people that are becoming Uber drivers? And even if we can learn a lot about what's going on in Uber, that's not always going to give an externally valid estimate to what's generally going on in the economy. So these are things you always have to grapple with when you have a data set that is very detailed in an internal validity sense, but you have to worry about external validity. And then the replication issue. That's a big issue, and it's hard to think about the right way to solve that. How do you make data available for a replication that still preserves privacy or uh, contracts where the, you have to purchase data and the company selling it, you know, that's their intellectual property. You can't just go and post it on the internet um, for everyone to work with. And that's, a, that's a, I think, a point where we need to make some progress. And I'll say a couple things uh, that toward the end, but it's, it's hard to solve that sort of a public goods problem. Um, I will give two specific examples from my own work um, where I've used data that comes from these non-traditional sources that I think really just the raw data add a lot of transparency on um, a couple key questions that we've been grappling with for a long time. So there's a long, long literature of understanding the key drivers of the gender wage gap in economics. Um, and many drivers are likely at play, but one uh, recent theory that, or not theory that I think is recently very important for understanding the wage gap is trying to understand empirically why it's a common feature that men working long hours earn a higher hourly rate than observably similar women who work in observably similar jobs but just work fewer hours per week. So obviously the men are going to earn more in total earnings because they work more, but they also tend to work, earn more per hour. Um, and what could be driving that phenomenon. Um, and uh, using some Uber data, we can actually test um, a number of theories that traditionally you wouldn't be able to observe or test in the data. And then a, a second question I've worked with um, using some of this linked bank account and credit card data is trying to understand the relationship between consumption inequality and income inequality, and whether observed differences in income inequality really map to observed differences in, in consumption inequality. And this is um, joint work with Enrico Moretti. So starting on the gender wage gap, um, we know that today the average woman earns about 88% of a similar, um, a similar man and similar jobs, and a number can bounce around a bit depending on where you measure it and what you control for, but ballpark sort of 88 cents on the dollar. And this gap is increasing as you find a larger gap um, when uh, women work few hours per week relative to men um, and also have weaker continuity of work. So women that are going in and out of the labor force more tend to earn less um, when they are working per, per hour than um, similar men in terms of demographics and the type of work they're doing. And we also see the gender gap rising over the life cycle where it's largest um, in, in middle age. So one mechanism that could be at play here um, that has been talked about a lot um, by Claudia Golden and others is a potential job flexibility penalty. So it could be that, um, and that it, it, one reason this could be going on is there's sort of it's hard to substitute tasks between workers. So if you and your colleague are both working, let's say, uh, for a bank and you have clients and you know those clients and you know when they want to trade and they want, when, what type of portfolio they want um, and you have a relationship with them, if you take a day off and you're not there when that person wants to make a trade, it may be hard to substitute this uh, other worker at work to sort of take over for you because you have sort of internal knowledge and this relationship. And that's going to create sort of um, a, product, a production function where if you work more hours per week, that those additional hours are especially productive because you can kind of internalize some of those substitutions where you don't have to substitute between the two workers, you can just always be there for your client. So that's sort of a technology that would create this convexity between hours and earnings. Um, and if this is really about a lack of being able to substitute between workers creating this convex hours earnings relationships, then if we had a technology that could make workers more substitutable, we might get rid of this uh, job flexibility penalty and narrow the gender pay gap. So, you know, imagine instead of having two uh, employees each who have their own specific clients, 
Imagine they sort of work as a team and they're sort of both working as a pair for all the clients and they sort of both learn and maybe they have some, some computerization and technology that makes it easier to write down all of the nuances about this relationship. That might make those two workers more substitutable and also allow both workers to say work, you know, part time and not really have much of a loss in terms of total productivity. Now, if that's going on, this type of technology of making workers substitutable could be a very important and desirable technology. Um, but we don't actually have a lot of direct evidence of looking at what might the labor market look like in this type of scenario. So we're going to use the market for Uber drivers as a, as a laboratory um, because because Uber is so you know, simple in the sense of we know this simple formula of how workers get paid um, and we can rule out a lot of the traditional forces that could be driving a gender pay gap when we look at male Uber drivers versus female Uber drivers. Um, so we know that the wage is not negotiated on, it's just a set formula, so there's no gender differences in pay uh, with negotiation. There's no per se premium for working longer hours. The formula does not include um, anything about, oh, you worked 40 hours this week, I'm going to just pay you more for that next ride. Um, and we also know that the formula does not have a per se discount if you're a woman. So we don't pay female drivers less just because they're a woman. But when you actually look in the Uber data, there is a gender pay gap. If you look at hourly earnings uh, for men and women, you see that the average man earns about 7% more than the average, average woman. Um, and indeed, there's not likely to be a job flexibility penalty because the whole point of Uber is that all the drivers are basically perfectly interchangeable. Now, if we skip along, if you actually look at the raw data um, in terms of hourly rates relate and how they relate to uh, intensity of work per week, this is this the blue line at the top there, which is plotting how much more per week does the average driver who works say 40 hours per week relative to the average driver who works you know five to ten hours a week. And you see what looks like this convex hours earnings relationship where the workers who are working many hours per week seem to earn more per hour than the workers who work few hours per week which is just like what you see in traditional data sets when you measure uh, these things in the census or in the CPS. But what's really going on here in Uber is the fact that the people who work 40 hours per week, they work 40 hours per week many weeks and they accumulate a lot of experience on the job. So they learn the good places to drive, they learn the good times of day to drive, how to strategically accept and cancel rides, and they get better at using their time efficiently and being a more productive Uber driver. So there's this correlation between week on week out labor supply and long run experience acquisition. And typically, if you had the census or the CPS data set, you wouldn't be able to measure this highly detailed measure of exactly how much experience each worker has on that specific job. But in Uber, we can just count how many rides you've done in the past and measure experience essentially perfectly. And note, if you actually control um, for experience um, just adding in these simple controls for the experience categories, that's this, re and re-estimate the relationship between hours per week and uh, hourly wage, now you completely flip the relationship. You find that the workers holding fix their amount of experience, the people who work 40 hours a week on average earn less per hour than the people who work 5 to 10 hours a week. Now why is that? That's coming from the fact that if you're going to work 40 hours a week, you can't cherry pick the really high premium times a day and still work 40 hours. There are only so many hours a week, and if the most prime time hours are like five to ten specific hours that really pay a lot, you're going to kind of have to go down and work some of those more mediocre hours to really rack up a 40 hour work week. Now that could be different in, say, manufacturing, where you might expect all hours are equally productive, but it highlights that this implication of what looks like a job uh, flexibility penalty is really just a proxy for differences in long run experience. And separating out these two differences is really important for policy, right? Because my example before about the two workers who worked at the bank and each had those clients and relationships, just putting them together and having them share clients is not going to change anything about long run experience differences between those two types of workers. And if it really is about these differences in long run experience, you wouldn't expect those types of technology of making workers substitutable to narrow a gender pay gap. 
Now, I don't want to say that this job flexibility penalty is zero. Likely there are many jobs where indeed job flexibility penalties are big and important. But here in Uber, where we know they can't be a big deal even before I ran the regression, you, can still, you still get what looks like a traditional job flexibility penalty. So it sort of highlights that with accurate measures of things like experience, we completely um, can reverse what we might have thought, have, we had, what we thought we had seen in traditional data sets. Okay, so changing gears a bit here, um, to talk briefly about some work on consumption inequality. So this is an age-old question of how unequal is consumption in the U.S. Most of the time we're interested in income inequality as a proxy for material well-being inequality. If you're earning a lot of money but you're, you know, not really consuming any of it, is it really so differences in sort of utility or well-being? What we really care about is sort of these differences in, in, in true, in true uh, economic utility and well-being. And usually you can't measure that, and indeed even measuring consumption is typically very hard. Um, the Consumer Expenditure Survey has been known to strongly underreport total consumption. So here's a graph where if you look at what the average household expenditure is, according to the CEX, is about $53,000. Um, but if you look at the national income accounts, or sort of GDP type data, it's a, it should be about $75,000. So it's, we've known for a long time we're missing about a third of consumption in the CEX, but when you work with bank and credit card data um, from one of these data providers that Scott talked about before, you get a number, this number you know, depends on exactly which data set you lose, but it's much, much closer to the aggregates, which is sort of validating that there's a lot better information on consumption in these bank and credit card data than in these traditional sources. And indeed, the distributional consequences of that, of income and consumption inequality, cons the CEX is even worse. So if you look at uh, the differences in savings rates across the income distribution, in the um, bank and credit card data, you can see that a household that earns, you know, let's say $163,000, according to the bank and credit card data, they're going to save about 15%. Seems kind of reasonable. If you looked in the consumer expenditure survey, you have to sort of uh, exponentiate in your head, but this says that they should be saving 80, 80%, 70% of their, of their income, which we seems like an insane number. So it just highlights that we know so little about the distribution of consumption in the US from, these, from traditional sources, and even just getting access to these um, new data sets can completely change uh, our view of how unequal consumption is in the US. Um, so just wanted to conclude, uh, there's lots of new data out there. It requires a lot of legwork, and you have got to convince firms to work with academics who are not, not used to working with academics. But the accessibility is one of the biggest problems we face. How do we deal with allowing researchers to have equal footing and equal access to different data sets? It's not necessarily fair if you have a bigger research budget to be able to work with better data. I think UChicago Booth's partnership with Nielsen seems like the gold standard here. They've really invested and partnered with Nielsen, who used to sell their data one-off to researchers, but now Nielsen just gives all of their scanner data to Booth, and you can now have a subscription, an academic subscription to the Booth Nielsen data, which is far cheaper and really accessible to all. Um, but it required Booth to provide this big public good. So you could imagine wanting to have more settings like that, um, which hopefully we will see, see more of going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. So we have about the next 30 minutes for Q&A. So I invite anyone to come up to the mic who has any questions. And I hope to hear from students hoping to access new data sets to come ask, ask us about uh, how, to get, how to get access to these data sets or what we've learned about our experience working with data sets. But first, I want to ask the panel, so suppose you want, so you have a lot of experience going to firms and getting access to these data. What have you learned in that process? Like what, if you have a great idea, you want to go to approach a firm about using their data, what should you do? I would say you should, you should do every, all of the above because you don't know what's going to work with which firm. So some firms I've met an employee at a conference or through a friend of a friend at a conference and just started talking to them and that led to partnering with the company and working with their data, and that worked out great. Um, other companies have no interest in that, but if they typically are in the business of selling the data, then you have to work with this negotiation of how much you're willing to pay and convince them that we are not you know, large 
individual corporations who can pay the prices that they're used to paying. So I've spent a lot of time working with these companies and convincing them that I will pay them something, but I cannot pay anywhere close to what um, they might be wanting or typically selling that data for. So I think partnering and purchasing um, are both great strategies. I mean, Infotour, I literally found them on a Google search. So you can, you can find lots of data out there on the internet. You want to cold email all these companies. Their websites are often opaque about what exactly they have. But just the more spam you can send to these guys, the better. I'd also add, if, uh, especially for students, um, if you're trying to work you know, through a partnership and not necessarily just a data purchase agreement, uh, be prepared to go spend some time like on site at, at you know, whatever company you're, you're working with. Um, it makes things both just m kind of much more smooth um, and you can achieve results kind of a, a lot faster than trying to do everything remotely. Yeah, maybe I was also a couple of things. One is that, you know, many companies actually have people that actually are interested in research inside. You know, it's kind of difficult. You need to convince the business side too, but it's very useful to kind of figure out within, the, especially large companies, if you can find people that actually care about research because they may they have just, just an interest in research or they're, and, and second. You have to convince the legal side. I know, no, I, the, the legal side and the business yeah, side yeah, as well. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is that you need to be kind of often creative on figuring out exactly what is the value you're providing to the company, you know, like, in, you know, in many sense, like we are bringing skills to companies that they could value in understanding their own data, for example, in understanding their own clients, you know, and, uh, and you need to like, figure out what is the right angle, and that's crucial because the, you're going to be a cost for them otherwise, and they're not going to do it. So, what do you think are the, what do you think are the most promising data sets people aren't using, or that people should start using more of? So I'll, I, uh, all of the above. <laughs> so I'm going to be a gotcha question. I think I'll, I'll uh, answer it first. So I think GPS data and location data is underutilized. I've heard Matt Ginchka was telling me that he uh, he's writing a paper about spatial segregation. So do, do different races spend time in different locations? Like do they avoid certain neighborhoods? Do they frequent the same rec restaurants? And so he's using cell phone data to study that of like where are people throughout the day? I think if I had access to the data, there's so many interesting questions you can answer of like, who goes to parks? Where do people run? Like, you know, how do people commute? Um, I think, you know, there's probably going to be like hundreds of papers written using that data. And if I were a student, I would like do whatever it takes to get access to that data and, and try to write a paper with it. Are there data sets like that that you're excited by? So I'll, I'll give a kind of a self-interested answer uh, or self-promotional perhaps. Um, so I, I think, you know, with the transactional data that, that, you know, a few of us have worked with, everybody's kind of used it to study consumption questions or macro questions or household questions or investment questions. Um, but uh, I, I think one thing that's really untapped so far is that, you know, you also have all these links to, um, you know, the firms that you're doing all of this spending at. So you have every transaction, every retailer that somebody, you know, transacts at. Um, so I have a working paper that's looking at, at kind of turning things around and, and looking, trying to use them as transactional data to say something about the retailer side. But I think in terms of like corporate finance and um, I.O. And, and some of these other fields, you know, outside of household, I think that this transactional data is really going to be uh, invaluable for a study not of households but a, kind of in terms of customers um, and transactions in that sense. Mm -hmm. So expect to see more of that, I think. Yeah. I just want to make a couple of points sir, about how to, how to use interesting data sets that you might come across. So <clears throat> yes, you might find one that tells you where people run in the morning and how long people run every morning. But somehow, that data has to help you answer something about finance. So the data could be super interesting from a personal standpoint. But if it's not something that allows you to address a, an important question that you can justify to a broad finance audience, don't waste your time actually collecting the data or looking at it. It's, you gotta be strategic if you're a PhD student or if you're a young faculty member who is, who's got a 10-year clock that's getting shorter and shorter and shorter, you can't just play around with data. You need to look at something that's relevant that addresses a question that the whole field cares about. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to you know, rain on your parade here, but you gotta be strategic. So maybe let me add a couple of things uh, to the question of, uh, of new data. I think that uh, uh, so a couple of things. One is that actually you know it is very exciting to see all these all these uh, new data that are being collected right now, but there's actually a huge amount of historical data that right now we can actually you know collect because 
you know, so for example, think of text data or newspaper data or, or patent data. There's like an enormous amount of, of data that basically would, it was always there, but we kind of couldn't handle. And now we do all, you know, think of unstructured data like text. Now we have kind of these machine learning tools that really allow us to kind of interpret that and link it to other data sets. And, and that's, I think that's an underexplored set of data. Not because we didn't have the data, because we didn't know how to handle it. And that was the first point I want to make. And then the second point is that actually where I think that things are actually kind of under, um, underutilized is kind of linking different data sets. So one, you know, if you think about the way that this new data is being collected and produced, it's very scattered. So you have like some company collecting some type of data, you know, you know, satellite images and some other companies collecting data about the, you know, the, the production chain, the supply chain. And I think there's a, you know, if you can figure out, so there's, my point is there's, there's, I think there's a huge value in figuring out what are interesting connections between different data sets. So think of LinkedIn allow you to connect, you know, employers and employees. It's a huge, hugely important connection. So I think connecting different data sets uh, is also a fundamental task. I can say with only with only one mic, you know, if you have a loud voice and a and a hand, you know, feel free to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I'm working with some data myself. Uh, some are from the government and some from my company from the private sector. Before I came to this session, I was not concerned about uh, about the sort of reputation of using the internal or even the point of the job market. Um, and now you guys raised this concern about um, if this data set can not be published online, uh, no one else. Can So the question is, when you're working with a data set that can't be produced online or might be proprietary, you might not be able to replicate it, or some journals require um, that you, you, know, you provide the data. So do we have any suggestions on how to work with that or what you can do? So, I mean, I, I'd say right now, you know, if the question is, you know, should you drop this and change your research topic, I would say no. Um, I, I think this is you know, a, a broader concern like for the profession and not necessarily for any individual researcher. There's been some, you know, sometimes some referees have been a, a bit hesitant, and I've, I've heard from different people, but I think in general, the, the, the quality of the paper, and, you know, if it's an interesting data, if it's interesting paper, interesting question, um, you, you, sh you probably won't face that many difficulties publishing it. But I think that's, you know, the problem kind of for the profession. If everything from now on is going to be like proprietary data that nobody can access, that's, that's a problem for, you know, it's great that people can publish their papers still. Um, but it's, it makes it more difficult down the, down the, down the road. Um, so I, I think you'll be in good shape still um, for the market and stuff, but um, yeah. So I would say that the editorial team should be aware that you cannot share your data. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a trade-off between the importance of the question that you're addressing using this data and, and the fact that you cannot share. So there's a cost to the profession and, and because they cannot replicate what you're doing. And again, the editor should decide carefully on what side of the trade-off to, to land. Um, it's, if it's a good question, the paper will be published, but you will be asked to probably to provide some aggregate measures based on your data and assess, like Scott here had to do, whether or not in the aggregate, the stuff you're looking at using these micro-level data matches what we've seen in other sources that we're comfortable with. So you have to to show that what you're using somehow matches something else that we've seen before, but you don't have to do it at the micro level. Can I just add one thing? So I, I want to strike a slightly more positive note on this, which is, that, so first of all, I think it's inevitable we're going to end up with more and more proprietary data. I also, I'm not, I guess, as concerned as the average person in the profession about this for the following reason, is that ultimately we're studying hopefully universal kind of behavior and that, you know, it will show up in other data as well. And so, you know, there's the, if you have an important result that you're showing in your one data set, you know, you have all the incentives to get things right, and because there will be other data sets will speak to the same questions, and the same, and the same fact will show up somewhere else, and other people will replicate with different data. And sooner or later, we're gonna kind of have accumulation of evidence from different sources. So. I think that, you know, it's kind of if you want indirect replication, right? But it, it is there. It, you know, you see it all the time. Different papers looking at the same, you know, housing data in the UK and the, the US and in, in Singapore and all these data. So I think that um, that's kind of nice. Are there any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is, we, Facebook, Google, Amazon make suggestions to users, provide a feed, provide uh, suggestions, rankings. So how do we disentangle people's behavioral decisions from the algorithm that's assisting in making those decisions? I mean, I could take a stab. I mean, I, I think that, you know, all of these, I mean, if the worry is that, uh, you know, the data you're using is kind of more contaminated by, I guess, these issues than something that's, that's taken from aggregate data, um, I mean, there's been marketing forever, right? There's been advertising forever. There's always been suggestions of, of what to buy. And so I think, you know, consumption, wherever you get your consumption data, they're, they're, you're going to be prone to behavioral biases. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if you're trying to compare the, the purchasing habits on Amazon versus off Amazon, I, there's, I think there's a couple of papers actually coming out, coming out soon about um, some, of, some of this exact um, topic. And so maybe, you know, a component of, of any difference of online purchase might be this more detailed, you know, suggestions data. Uh, so I think it's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily like, invalidates um, the, the, uh, like the consumption that's done on these platforms, but uh, definitely an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's certainly an open, like an interesting open question of, of to what extent does your behavior on these, some of these sites differ from similar behavior off of them? Uh, definitely. Yeah. Question. One line of the discussion was that there are like new data sources and they are richer and uh, how they compare to some traditional data sources. Right? So are these new data sources, how are they different? They are richer? So the question is, are the, some of these new data sets going to be publicly available, like CompuStat, et cetera, like, or open source for researchers to use? Yeah. yeah. I think some of it depends on which data we're talking about. Um, I think the government is increasingly uh, providing electronic versions of data that they have always collected. So my example before about CoreLogic sells housing deed data for most of the country. You know, you can now go to most county websites for the deeds office and just hit download and download at least the recent history of housing transactions totally for free. And they're all coded up with a code book, which 10 years ago, you would have to get the paper copies and, and put in. So I think the government is stepping in and, and digitizing stuff that they used to provide in paper is definitely one place where publicly available data is coming from. Um, I mean, other stuff like like Google Trends, you know, aggregates of proprietary data are more and more available. And Zillow also provides house price indices that are free. Um, and I think oftentimes those, you know, can not totally dominate, but be a decent substitute for some previously for paid sources. But it really depends on, you know, who's collecting the data and which type of data we're talking about. Yeah, and so, and, and kind of like the, you know, CompuStats and CRISP, is, for some of the subscription services like CoreLogic and um, like Nielsen, um, which was also mentioned, that you know, so f at an academic subscription level, they're kind of becoming more available. So I, I think you know. I see, I see the paper So uh, yeah, I mean, some of these are, are just kind of scraped of, of publicly of like websites, and you know, some of that might be breaking some terms of service, <laughs> um, but you know, it's. Quasi public, I, I imagine that it will be publicable. Um, yeah. 
So there's one more thing I'd like to add, which is that a lot of these, uh, so if you think especially about financial data, especially about data that speak to us at pricing, right? These data are being basically bought by the, by the, by the financial industry and they have extremely high prices because of course there's a lot of money involved. Um, but there's also, you already seen it for some data set, there's been basic commoditization of these data sets. So, you know, once like people are, like once enough people are trading on it, there's no money to be made, right? The prices are gonna drop. And so for example, you know, I don't know, some, much, some satellite data uh, used to be really at the, at the forefront of the industry, like it's not anymore, like many people are now trading on this data. So I expect that many of these data that now are extremely expensive would be able to come much cheaper and then at some point, university can afford it. So shifting gears to methods, what methods do you think are most promising for researchers and students should be paying attention to? Should I go? I go. go ahead. Um, so I think that, um, so obviously there's a lot of excitement about machine learning. I, I believe that that is kind of the frontier. And there's, but I want to, maybe more specific, I, I would say, kind of two types of methods. One is methods to deal with unstructured data, uh, like for example, text interpretation, and that just because that's gonna just open up so many potential avenues for research. And the other, which I have mentioned in my, in my talk before, is with the intersection of econometrics and machine learning. And, mm -hmm. and because we as economists, we care about kind of causal inference, and we care about structural parameters, we care about the, you know, the deeper mechanisms of behavior, and so we kind of need to do inference. And there's some really beautiful like frontier research that people are doing econometrics that merges the power of machine learning with the sound econometrics. And to me, that's kind of the, these are the new methods that uh, I think will be the future of this. Mm -hmm. so. so I think that um, you need to learn how to deal with very large data sets. That's what I'm learning these days. I'm, I used to be a Stata person, and I have to become an R and Python person who uses Spark, because we're dealing with you know, billions of rows of data, and I, this has to be hosted on, in an infrastructure that I wasn't even aware about of, of you know, a year ago. So I'm not saying you need to learn to do machine learning. I'm saying you need to learn how to host and do simple statistics on very large data sets and you can build on from there. I'd, I'd say kind of on the other end as well that you know, there, there's, um, having some of this big data can provide you with the ability to use a lot more complex tools. And, you know, some of the machine learning, big data tools, you know, SQL, getting into Hive or something. Um, but it can also sometimes let you do, mu use much simpler tools. Um, so to the extent that now you have all of this, you know, trend, like say for this linked account, you know, transaction level data, to the extent now you have all of these different variables that you, you, know, you didn't have before, you might not have to make as many heroic assumptions or you know, make all these imputations or you know, do some complex statistics to try to, to um, you know, find the, the coefficient that you want. Now you can just kind of control for all the things you want to control for that you couldn't before. Um, and so it can actually you know, allow for a lot more simplicity and transparency um, than with you know, a data set where you have you know, one X variable and then like six imputed X variables that are, you know, proxied for by all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, I agree with the, the simplicity. Um, a lot of interest in causal effects, you, you're trying to come up with a clever instrument or some clever policy change. When you can really observe a lot of detail, there, there's lots more quirky things you can live, like these sort of natural experiments out there that if you have some insight into sort of how the nitty gritty work at you know, certain companies pay at different pay frequencies for whatever reason, and you can just use that data directly. And if you observe that in these big data sets, you don't need, you know, a lot of fancy methods. You can just live off the fact that you have some outside insight on how the world works in quirky ways and just use that directly in the data. Yeah. Thanks for the panel, it was very nice. Uh, my question, I also work with some sort of a Finnish administrative data, so it's a big panel, as in big data, really. So one of the questions is more about the practicalities, as in, so you see like T-stats of like, you run a regression, you get a T-stat of 50, 20, it's very hard to sell. So when an asset pricing guy looks at it, or somebody from corporate finance looks at it, uh, they are looking at these numbers, which they have never seen probably in their lives. So my question is this, that um, it's more like, 
are we moving towards a different kind of inference with these data sets? Or, or as in, what's your experience about moving towards maybe away from null hypothesis, maybe something else? Or uh, are there new inference methods? It's not machine learning per se, what I'm asking. It's more like, are we going towards Bayesian methods or something else? As in, uh, is it always going to, is there, uh, is there value in investing time to learn these new or other inference techniques which go probably well along with really big data sets? I couldn't hear half the question because of the echo. Oh, but for what I understood, you're asking about what kind of like statistical, where you should do you know, Bayesian methods or other methods. Um, it's kind of hard to say exactly. I think it kind of depends a bit on the application you're trying to do. It depends on the data you're facing. I, you know, uh, I do. Th I mean, I do personally think that it's. It's. I guess it's hard to resist investing in these new statistical methods in general. Like I cannot tell you which ones exactly, uh, because it just opens up so many potential things to do. You know, from the simplest kind of things, just learning how to manage these big data sets to the more involved things. But it, it has to be kind of guided. Yeah, the statistics you use has to be guided by the problem you're you're facing. Yeah, I mean, so having, you know, worked with, you know, data sets with hundreds of millions of rows and sometimes millions of columns, um, you know, I think basically you should figure out what, how, what, what's the question you want to answer and what are the methods to get to that answer. Um, I think what I've seen is that, you know, dimensionality, like when you're working with really large data sets, often dimensionality reduction techniques, um, regularization like lasso, um, is really helpful in helping you uh, kind of like narrow down the size of the data and, and like, you know, narrow down the, 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 the data set you're working with. Um, so I think if you were going to work with really massive online data sets, then yes, you probably should invest in understanding some of these new inference techniques. But I really don't, I don't think you like should be going and, and you know, having to figure out all the nuances of machine learning and then getting, you know, a, a sample of countries and trying, you know, a neural network on like 150 observations, like you're going to be, you know, you're, you're not, uh, you're going to be definitely overfit by, and it's not going to work. So I think basically you should just figure out like what are the questions you're trying to answer, what's the data you need, and then how do you use that data before you go and invest a bunch of time. And I think a lot of these methods also are like, a lot of these new machine learning things are just reinventions of things they did in the 50s and 60s and old techniques. And so, you know, a, a lot of the causal inference stuff I learned as an economist are very similar to what engineers are doing as a, as a, when they implement machine learning. And so often you don't have to in, put a whole lot of investment in. You just have to, like, new, learn new ways of doing things or new tweaks of, of doing things. I guess one point I wanted to make was... You're right that oftentimes in the sort of traditional sampling framework, you end up with these enormous T stats, both because you observe a lot of stuff, so you have very good control groups that are very similar in all ways, but the thing you're looking at, and you have just massive data sets. But it highlights, at least my experience with both refereeing and responding to referees, that usually you're not so much arguing about sampling error, you're ar arguing about robustness and model misspecification and whether your estimates change if you make what seem like innocuous changes to how you set up the structure of what you're studying. And that's sort of has nothing to do with our, our standard errors and highlights that there's sort of a hard, that's a hard thing to statistically quantify, but, you know. And then also how to even deal with looking at those different robustness estimates. So you could imagine you do 10 different robustness estimates. They actually are all statistically significantly different from each other but they're all economically kind of in the same ballpark. Do you take away from that that they're all the same? Do you take away from that that we don't really understand the model, but it doesn't really matter? I think it forces us to ask questions about what are we really try trying to get at with, with, sam with, with uncertainty in our estimates, and it maybe isn't so much sampling error anymore. Can I add one thing which relates to, to this one, which is that, you know, it's, it's you get these enormous data sets, and for some questions, you do get enormous t-stats. But it's also true that the beauty of these big data sets, you have like really a lot of richness. This is something that I mentioned before, that you mentioned before. And there's, an, there's, a enormous, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity we can exploit. And once you start thinking about heterogeneity, in, let's say the treatment effects or you know, the, the, the means and so on, you actually start cutting a sample pretty thing. If you can start with an enormous sample and still get a t-stat of like 1.95, 
because, because you've like cut the sum. And, and, and we want to do that, okay? We want to go to the place, we want to push the data to tell as much as they can. So you don't naturally end up in this kind of situation. So, you know, standard statistics is still like hugely useful. Any other questions? Yeah. So the, is a question, when you have really big data, how do you prevent overfitting? I mean, if you're worried about like overfitting, I mean, so so there's been a few papers recently that have you know taken the approach of um, uh, kind of apportioning, taking a, a sample, a subset of the data, kind of a random subset, and kind of locking it away, um, and saying you know we're only going to run the analysis on you know these six million and, and not this two million, um, and kind of ex post take their model and apply it, and so to to try to reduce any overfitting. So. I, I think there's a lot more room to do that when you can when you can cut out a couple million observations and not, not really notice and have a have a nice test of um, you know whether whether you're still performing pretty well out of sample and, and where you weren't you know you you weren't um, uh, 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 kind of optimizing your code to, to deal with that. So I think that's you know one potential uh, path that people could take. Another one is um, to use one of several websites where you can go and pre-register your hypotheses. So. If ahead of time, before you even get access to the data, you say, I'm going to test whether the impact of X on Y is positive in this particular manner, and it's written down that you did this before you got your data, it is hard to, to blame you for da doing data snooping if exposed you find that sort of effect in your data. So you can pre-register your hypotheses online. Thanks. Anyone have any concluding thoughts they want to share? All right, well thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of your session.